on World News Tonight. Continuing crisis, Ukraine and the U.S. band together to strategize the influx of aid into the war-stricken country as leading figures in Russia's government warn against a possible third world war. Border panic, immigrants risk their lives making the journey from Mexico to America. Death tolls continue to rise on both sides of the border as the frequency of crossings increase to unprecedented highs. COVID chaos. Mass testing sweeps China as the nation takes no chances in curbing the spread of the virus. Strict testing policies cause mass panic among citizens who stock up on essentials in preparation for the worst case scenario. And modern magic. The ancient art of puppetry is now being kept alive with the help of technology's latest marvel, NFTs. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We're starting off with more updates on the crisis in Ukraine. The first official delegation to visit Ukraine since the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia conflict has drawn to a close, with negotiations allowing for more aid to the war-stricken country being successful. Wrapping up the first official U.S. visit to Ukraine since Russia invaded, Washington's top diplomat and its defense chief said Russian efforts in Ukraine were so far failing. Uh, in terms of Russia's war aims, Russia has already failed and Ukraine has already succeeded. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, along with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, shared that assessment Monday at a briefing in Poland after meeting with President Volodymyr Zelensky and other top Ukrainian officials. The visit was designed to show Western support. It also highlighted the shift in the conflict since Ukrainian forces successfully repelled a Russian assault on Kiev. Secretary Austin said the invasion had hurt Russia's military and Washington would like to see it further degraded. Uh, we want to see Russia uh, uh, weakened uh, to the degree that it can't uh, do the kinds of things that uh, it has done uh, in, in invading Ukraine. So it has already lost a lot of military capability. Uh, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of its troops, quite frankly. And uh, we want to see them not have the capability to very quickly reproduce that capability. During the visit, Blinken and Austin pledged more than $322 million in additional military aid, taking total U.S. security assistance to Ukraine since the invasion began to about $3.7 billion, according to a senior State Department official who said the funding would also help Ukraine's armed forces transition to more advanced weapons and air defense systems. With Russia's military focus now hundreds of miles to the east in the Donbass region, U.S. officials said U.S. diplomats would soon return to Kiev. And the White House announced Monday that President Joe Biden was nominating veteran diplomat Bridget Brink as the new U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, a crucial position that was vacant for nearly three years. Just weeks ago, Kiev was a frontline city under curfew and bombardment, with tens of thousands of Russian troops on its northern outskirts. Today, normal life is beginning to return. Blinken told reporters it was evidence that the battle for Kiev was won, but he warned it was in stark contrast to other parts of Ukraine, where he said, quote, the Russian brutality is just horrific. Russia is now voicing concerns of a possible breakout of a third world war in response to the recently concluded talks between American diplomats and Ukraine. However, Western powers are adamant on diminishing the country's firepower to prevent a repeat of the mass conflict. On Monday, Russia's foreign minister gave a dire warning that the possibility of World War III is a real threat. But despite criticizing the Ukrainian president's approach to the negotiations, he said the peace talks will continue. The danger is serious. It's real. You can't underestimate it. But we are continuing to engage in negotiations with the team delegated by Vladimir Zelensky, and these contacts will go on. Meanwhile, President Zelensky echoed similar sentiments about the severity of the situation, but said that Kyiv would be accelerating its application to join the European Union, a move unlikely to encourage mediation. Everyone in the world, even those who openly did not support us, now agree that it is in Ukraine that the fate of Europe, the fate of global security and the fate of the democratic system is decided. 
The comments come a day after America's most senior diplomats made their first visit to the country since the war began. Announcing the gradual return of U.S. diplomatic presence in Ukraine, hundreds of millions in military financing to Kyiv and its Eastern European neighbors, as well as indicating they thought Ukraine could overthrow Moscow's invasion. Zelensky's repeated calls for more firepower have recently seen weapons and equipment pour into Ukraine from its Western allies, despite Russia's firm disapproval in what Ukrainian officials believe could be crucial in resisting the ongoing Russian offensive. Now moving on to the U.S., the desperation grows as does the tension at the U.S.-Mexico border. Following an unfortunate increase in casualties as more and more migrants struggle to enter the country through desperate means, some being too unfortunate to make it to the other side. Tonight on the southern border, frantic desperation. A shrieking mother plunging into the Rio Grande, chased by Mexican authorities, scrambling to stop the surge of migrants. This family from Cuba, like thousands of others, risking everything to cross. For more than two years, many migrants have been denied entry because of Title 42, a public health policy enacted during the pandemic by the Trump administration, which expedited deportations back to Mexico. U.S. officials telling 170,000 migrants are waiting in Mexico, ready to cross, while the White House lifts the Title 42 restriction on May 23rd. We ask them what their plan will be. No plan is given. Today, a Republican delegation led by House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy toured Eagle Pass, criticizing the White House for failing to find a permanent solution. The group also honored specialist Bishop Evans, a National Guardsman whose body was recovered today in the Rio Grande. Authorities say he disappeared in a fast current Friday, trying to save two drowning migrants. Meanwhile, on judicial disputes, the U.S. judicial system has taken strict action against former President Donald Trump's unwillingness to comply with court orders, such as handing in essential documents for inspection. Trump has now to pay up to $10,000 per each day he refuses to hand over the said documents. Former President Donald Trump was held in contempt of court by a New York judge Monday for not providing documents subpoenaed by the state attorney general. Trump will be fined $10,000 per day until he complies. Trump lost his fight against a subpoena from state attorney general Letitia James, then failed to produce all the documents by a court-ordered March 3rd deadline, later extended to March 31st at his lawyer's request. The judge ruled contempt was appropriate because of repeated failures to hand over the materials. Trump was not in the courtroom. James is investigating whether the former president's family company, the Trump Organization, misstated the values of its real estate properties to get favorable loans and tax deductions. James has said her probe had found significant evidence, suggesting that for more than a decade, the company relied on misleading asset valuations. A lawyer for Trump and the company said at a hearing that James' investigation was a fishing expedition. Trump, a Republican, denies wrongdoing and has called the investigation politically motivated. James is a Democrat. Over now in North Korea, sources say the country held a military parade to celebrate a key anniversary of its regime. It's believed there were thousands of troops along with a wide range of military equipment, including the regime's most powerful missiles. According to the Korean Central News Agency, the North's leader Kim Jong-un did indeed attend last night's military parade, celebrating the 90th anniversary of the founding of its People's Revolutionary Army at Pyongyang's Kim Il-sung Square. He delivered a speech vowing to keep on developing his regime's nuclear weapons and threatening their use if national interests are encroached. He says if the North's nuclear arms are originally for prevention of war, but the worst-case scenario, he says, they shouldn't be limited to just the prevention of war. Based on data from the Unification Ministry, there have been 12 military parades under Kim Jong-un's rule to date, and the leader has delivered a speech himself in five of them, including last night. The parade is believed to have started around 10 p.m. Monday night following a one-hour pre-ceremony event. It was widely expected the parade would take place the night before at midnight on Sunday or in the early hours of Monday, but weather conditions could have been the delay. 
South Korean military and intelligence authorities suspect the parade was the largest ever and that the regime might have flaunted some of its newest weaponry, such as the Hwasong-8 hypersonic missile, Hwasong-17 intercontinental ballistic missile and a submarine-launched ballistic missile. They estimated roughly 20,000 troops and 250 pieces of military equipment were mobilized. Citing satellite imagery, several media outlets earlier reported their preparations involving thousands of troops, hundreds of military vehicles and even pontoon bridges. North Korea state media has also released celebratory articles declaring their loyalty to the regime. It's expected the North State Television Network will air a recorded version of the parade sometime today. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now to some updates on the COVID pandemic. Mass testing programs that sweep through China have begun to cause panic amongst the citizens, as possibilities of swift lockdown seem increasingly probable. Residents have begun to stock up on supplies to prepare for the worse. In Beijing, residents have been clearing supermarket shelves as mass COVID-19 testing began in the Chinese city's biggest district on Monday, prompting fears of a Shanghai-style lockdown. Uneasy shoppers crowded into stores and placed online orders trying to stock up on items such as fresh leafy vegetables, fresh meat, instant noodles and rolls of toilet paper. Supermarket chains in Beijing, including Carrefour and Wumart, say they have more than doubled their inventories to account for the increased demand. And Meituan's grocery-focused e-commerce platform increased stocks and the number of staffers for sorting and delivering, according to the state-backed Beijing Daily. Testing, which is currently taking place in the capital's most populous district, Chaoyang, comes after dozens of cases were reported in recent days. 70 locally transmitted cases have been found in eight of the capital's 16 districts since Friday, a local official said. Residents and those who work in Chaoyang, home to 3.4 million people, have been ordered to test three times this week and reduce public activities, although most schools, stores and offices remain open. More than a dozen buildings in Chaoyang have also been put under lockdown. While the Chinese capital's caseload is small compared with those globally and the hundreds of thousands in Shanghai, the country is continuing to stick by its COVID elimination strategy. An illegal oil refinery in Nigeria has exploded, causing deaths on a major scale. Casualty numbers continue to climb well past the 100s. The accident at Niger Delta has prompted a response from Nigeria's president, who vowed to bring forward a stronger crackdown on such illegal activities. More than 100 people have died in an explosion at an illegal oil refinery site in Nigeria. The blast on Saturday night left charred bodies scattered between scorched palm trees and vehicles. Flip-flops, bags and clothing belonging to the deceased littered the ground. The Niger Delta has been blighted by decades of oil spills into farmland, creeks and lagoons. That's exacerbated the unemployment and poverty that makes illegal oil refining attractive. Crude oil is tapped from a web of pipelines owned by oil majors and refined in makeshift tanks. But, as at this site on the border between Nigeria's rivers and Imo states, there can be deadly consequences. Cyril Duru, Imo state's commissioner for environment, said a mass burial would be organized. Nigeria is Africa's biggest oil producer and exporter. Government officials estimate the country loses an average 200,000 barrels of oil per day to illegal tapping and the vandalism of pipes. That's more than 10% of production. Nigeria's president, Mohamedou Buhari, described the accident as a catastrophe and a national disaster, and said he would intensify a clampdown on illegal refineries. Following tense negotiations from a seemingly unrelenting public company, Elon Musk has emerged the victor as Twitter, the famously publicly operated social media company, amassing millions of users across the globe, has now been acquired by the world's richest man for a whopping 44 billion US dollars. Elon Musk clinched a deal to buy Twitter for 44 billion dollars on Monday in a transaction that will shift control of the social media platform populated by millions of users and global leaders to the world's richest man. Yes. The company had adopted a so-called poison pill to resist the billionaire's takeover efforts, 
but changed course after Musk unveiled a financing package, which includes $33.5 billion from his own fortune. Musk, an active Twitter user with more than 83 million followers, has said Twitter needs to be taken private to grow and become a genuine platform for free speech. Many Republicans welcomed news of the sale and called on Musk to return former President Donald Trump to the social media platform. Shares of Twitter jumped as high as 6.5% on Monday to above $52, but still below Musk's offer of $54.20 per share. The all-private space team that made global headlines previously for their ambitious commute to the International Space Station has now successfully completed their mission and has returned back to Earth, splashing down following the landmark two-week stay aboard the station. The first all-private astronaut team to have ever flown aboard the International Space Station safely splashed down Monday in the Atlantic Ocean off Florida's coast. The return concludes a two-week science mission hailed as a landmark in commercialized human spaceflight. The crew capsule, provided by Elon Musk's SpaceX, carrying the four-man team from Axiom Space, parachuted into the sea after a 16-hour descent from orbit. The mission's crew was assembled, equipped, and trained entirely at private expense by Axiom Space, a five-year-old venture based in Houston, Texas, and headed by NASA's former ISS program manager. The company has also contracted with NASA to build the first commercial addition to and ultimate replacement for the space station. The splashdown capped the latest and most ambitious in a recent series of rocket-powered expeditions bankrolled by private investment capital and wealthy passengers rather than taxpayer dollars, six decades after the dawn of the space age. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. In Madagascar South, crops regularly fail due to drought and land erosion. In an effort to increase production, legumes known as pigeon peas are being promoted by CTAS because they are drought resistant, highly nutritious and good for the soil. Seven Greenpeace activists have been arrested by Norwegian authorities for trying to stop a tanker from delivering Russian jet fuel to Norway. In a protest against the war in Ukraine, members of the advocacy group chained themselves to the Osteloga tanker to prevent it from docking. Hyundai posted a better than expected rise in quarterly profit as favorable exchange rates more than made up for a jump in raw material costs and a drop in sales caused by the global ship shortage. A Turkish court sentenced leading intellectual and rights campaigner Osman Kavala to life in prison on hugely controversial cool plot charges that had already seen him locked up without a conviction for more than four years. A sharp drop in graphic chip prices could presage an unexpectedly quick ending to a global chip crunch that has crippled manufacturing and the issue will be central for companies reporting results this week. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. If you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with Taiwan's longest running traditional puppet television show, creating non-fungible tokens or NFTs to help bring their art form to a new modern audience and generate a fresh income stream. Thank you for watching. Good night.